But you but see it you every see day it every if you day, go online, you go it's, online just like it's just like there's it's, there's, it's such a toxic such place. A toxic it's also place. it's also there's also, also, there's also beautiful there's stuff also that goes beautiful on online every day. I mean, I've made great friends. I mean, I've made great you know, friends. I got to watch a police you know, precinct burn to the ground last year on my phone, um, which was like maybe one of the only times I've felt some sort of hope for my kids' future. It's easier, someone once said, to imagine the end of the world than it is the end of capitalism. But it's clear that before we can make systems of this complexity, cultural systems, economic systems, machines of this complexity, surely we can make a world that could first meet those needs I described that everyone should have, and then perhaps meet needs that people have only dreamed of, like the need for some autonomy and free autonomy. The need for that little space up there, the eye part, to expand a little bit, just a little. Just a little. Just a little. The socialism that could engage with the yearnings and dreamings and Miles Davis music. An aesthetic dimension. Radically incompatible with everyday life under capitalism. Hey, hi all, welcome to another Acid Left podcast. I'm here with my regular co-host, Adam Ray Atkins. I'm Mike Watson as ever, and we have with us teenage stepdad, who maybe needs no introductions. He is a meme producer who has an Insta account, which is hugely successful, and a website um, under the name Teenage Stepdad. He's recently started broadcasting with Means TV, the kind of left-wing documentary subscription service, a series called i believe seize the memes where mm-hmm. he shows people bob ross style how to make memes uh, we'll talk about that a little a little bit later but it's great just to have um teenage stepdad here i mean he's, he's fairly enigmatic as a character um he's one of those producers that works under his his kind of pseudonym exclusively um and so it's great to have him here and be able to probe a little bit about um about how he does what he does and what he really thinks about what he's doing particularly in light of media critique because i've been largely a media critic and and also how do you work so maybe just we'll start with how you work in fact how do you get your ideas basically um Mm -hmm. how spontaneous are they do they come from looking at uh what's happening in the news um yeah how do you start yeah um well first off thanks for having me it's uh, fun to chat about this stuff i don't get a lot of opportunity to talk to adults about memes art and design media i mostly talk to my kids about pokemon so this is fun um how i work is kind of i've been kind of working the same way as long as i can remember where um i just kind of sit down and i've you know over the years explored a lot of different disciplines and they're all kind of at this point uh i i usually sit down and don't have any idea and um start playing around with inspiration i I think my starting point and i I make that point in the show sees the memes is starting from the point of inspiration because um in my meme work i think what i'm doing is kind of exploring the history of graphic design as an art form so uh what i enjoy doing is finding something i don't know how to pull off and starting with that and from that the design usually reveals to me what it's trying to say so just plugging along and going through that process that i enjoy and then i kind of step back at the end and something has kind of revealed itself to me you know sometimes it starts with an idea or a little seed of an idea but it 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 never really resembles what i set out to start making it always kind of morphs into what it wants to be it seems like there's a tension in your stuff between, you know, memes proper and art and design. Is that something that you've like consciously thought about when creating stuff? Yeah, I mean, sometimes I wonder if what I'm doing truly qualifies as memes because, you know, I think most people kind of define it in a very different way than I do. I think some of that's related to kind of the scene of creators that I kind of came up with where uh, you know, we're uh, n- we're not really doing the standard Twitter format sort of meme. We're kind of trying to do things that are more in the vein of art with our memes. Um, 
you know, make them a little bit more elaborate than what most people would define as uh, as a meme. I mean, I mean, I do I do do some topical stuff, but really what I enjoy doing is stuff that's more broad in general. It's like I'm not taking the current meme trend and remixing that as much as trying to do something that's kind of um, kind of apart from that. I don't know. I don't think that's really conscious. I think it's just I, I like to make things that take me, you know, four to six to eight hours to a couple days. I like to disappear for a while into the work. So that's really kind of um, why I tend to go more elaborate and have a little more going on uh, graphically and with uh, technique than your standard Twitter meme of a screenshot from a television show with a caption and, and whatnot. But um, yeah, I mean, I feel a lot of tension inside myself as far as like art, design, um, making memes which is making something with no regards to monetization um this is also my living as a freelancer doing graphic and design work and and even doing my commentary work um for a paycheck from time to time so all those things art commerce design uh propaganda they all are kind of in conflict with me and like I, i'm trying to kind of figure those things out within the confines of the 1080 by 1080 blank canvas and um so yeah yeah i think that's why a lot of that work has that in that because that's kind of a conflict inside myself and i i like a lot that there it's like the the lowbrow design work you know it doesn't feel like the fancy helvetica stuff it's you know pro wrestling and 80s VHS covers and fantasy novels and stuff like that thrown together, which I guess, you know, kind of break a lot of official design rules, but end up being much more visually appealing and alluring that you can sneak the messages into. Absolutely. Yeah, I uh, I've always kind of felt that um, that kind of more modern design style of flat stuff, you know, the uh, that stuff that most people when they think of graphic design they're going to think of you know the like Saul Bass and the dude who did the American Airlines logo and and that sort of stuff like the the New York City subway stuff and and to me that's always just seemed removed from my life and who I am as a person and the stuff that's messier and clearly made by people who were more like work a day designers which are kind of kind of how I feel in my career so I, I really relate to that stuff. And I was lucky to work in print and worked with people who used to do the pre-computer design with the the tapes and the little the little wax adhesive heat rollers. And they taught me a lot about what, what it was like in, uh, in those days before the computer came around where things were more based on illustration. Things had a lot more texture. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think it makes sense that that design is so appealing to people because it was made in an era where... Uh, everybody's relationship with media was physical and it was a crowded field and they'd want it to jump off the shelf. They had one shot at it. So what they did is put their best foot forward with great illustration, great type treatments. And just, um, so I've always really just responded to that stuff. And um, yeah, I think it is a little bit more of a lowbrow design, but if you go back and like, like, like you mentioned wrestling, there was, it was kind of incredible how they were, you know, it was definitely lowbrow, but they really pushed design a lot. I mean, the, the live motion graphics stuff that they were doing was really innovative. It's like, yeah, I mean, nobody really gave it its due at the time because it was wrestling. But if you look at it from a graphic design perspective, they really pushed things really far and um, real were really influential on the culture. I mean, their Chrome logos really kind of bled into all sorts of avenues of design. So yeah, like when I go, when I look for inspiration, that's kind of my guiding principle is like, as I'm looking around at stuff, like what's the thing that jumps off the shelf or jumps off the screen and and that's kind of my my that's how i judge if this if design is good or not is like if you see a bunch of it and one of those things pops out like yeah that's that's kind of that's kind of what appeals to me is to kind of try to recreate some of those tricks it seems to me that you're working very much in the vein of certain leftist historical art movements or art activist movements such as the the situationist international who 
use this process of what was called, uh, if I try and say it in French, détournement, um, which was kind of basically a, a, a means of taking advertising processes like slogans and leaflets and appropriating them for, for spreading left, left-wing left messages. Um, and you can see this kind of process discussed in Debord's famous Society of the Spectacle. And then later you see this being taken on by the the ad busters. I'm wondering if this is something that you are, are aware of. Is it something um, you deliberately do? And, and how much do you actually define as left wing? Because I've seen left wing statements, but your method is a bit to kind of like ironize everything. So so how much are you like taking? Yeah, aside? I I think I think that um, both of those questions I could kind of uh, address by. I mean, I, I guess I would say I'm not super familiar with, I'm sure that if I saw some pieces from that, it'd be like, it'd ring a bell um, from my, from years and years ago of studying art history. But really for me, I feel like I come from the school of really like Mad Magazine, which sounds like a very similar kind of perspective to the art movement you're referencing, which is using the, uh, you know, the methodology and the imagery of Madison Avenue to talk about the evils of Mad- Madison Avenue. And then later on, I, I, I'd say like a way, the way a band like Devo kind of approached this of like criticizing commercial culture directly by using the imagery and techniques of consumer culture. So I think it's more, um, I think it's more things like that. Like I grew up on Mad Magazine. I didn't realize it at the time. But it was really kind of warping my worldview to really take the perspective that everybody that tries to influence you uh, shouldn't be trusted. Uh, th- these were these were lessons that were planted in into me through humor and through cleverness and through great art, and they were like little seeds in my six-year-old head that just stayed there forever. And then I kind of I. I I guess I, I just loved that so much that I looked for it elsewhere in like punk rock music and graffiti and and uh, and I think that's kind of where I would place myself is to use the tools and imagery of commercial culture to criticize it. That's kind of classic situation is international stuff, whether you, you use the terms or not. And that's what's so interesting partly about your work is that you're just doing a lot of the stuff I've been talking about in my work, but many people have been talking about um, although you're doing it kind of quite effort, effortlessly through the actual visual media itself, whereas a lot of media theorists are like saying, this is what should probably be happening in meme culture, or this is what you know artists mm-hmm. could be doing with the internet, whereas you're taking a quite direct, where well, you're working on, it, on, on this very directly. Uh, I mean, Adam probably knows more about Adbusters, or certainly knows more about Adbusters than me, but I, I think Adbusters really continued in the same vein as a Situationist International. Yeah, they definitely did. They uh, kind of were the ones to super popularize in the 90s that taking an advertisement and kind of making it the exact opposite. Uh, to the point where I often see some Adbusters stuff shared in leftist groups now, and the leftist groups like on Facebook are criticizing it, not understanding that it's a satire. The one that really gets me, I see it like every six months, is a absolute vodka ad but it's like they raised your rent you raised your glass absolute vodka or something like that oh wow yeah like oh my god how can they be so sin like so unsensitive and stuff and it's like well no that's that is the point of this (laughs) you know Mm -hmm. trying to point it out this um one of my favorite memes of yours which is so simple and it's like a mad magazine cover and it's marx pulling off a mask which is like alfred's head the the character yeah um, and yeah, as soon as I saw that, it made me think of what you were talking about. Because likewise, as a kid growing up in the 90s, I bought a lot of Mad Magazines from garage sales and stuff and would read them. And it wasn't until much later that I realized the actual impact those had on me, uh, imparting that sense of irony and distrust of mainstream media. Yeah, really I good, and it shows the power of images and of comedy and satire like that. Oh, totally. And like, yeah, and I kind of hope that, you know, I hope that I've planted some of those seeds of distrust. Like, I really feel like that's such a, a, a great mission. 
um, for somebody in my position to do is to just plant, you know, just plant these little seeds that, yeah, you know, this is bullshit. And um, yeah, these people are lying to me because that's a lesson people should carry with themselves forever because it's always true. And yeah, you, you, you were reading Mad in the 90s, but you were lucky because you were getting the old stuff because at one point in the 90s, they started running real ads. And up to that point, I mean, any ad that appeared in Mad Magazine, like when I was in a kid in the 80s, every ad was a parody of an ad. There were not real ads in the magazine. And that was really important. I mean, that was, that was, it was a, it was like a commerce free zone when you were reading Mad Magazine. It was, you know, it was criticizing stuff on TV, it was criticizing stuff in film and really getting behind like why they were driving these narratives at you. It, it was criticizing Madison Avenue, it was criticizing the Pentagon, but it was doing it all through humor that kids could um, understand like on the surface. But it also had these little seeds implanted throughout that um, that really everybody I talked to who experienced Matt as a child kind of looks back on that experience and realizes that there was a lot more going on. Is that why you have so many um, pee pee poo poo diarrhea and boner joke, uh, yeah. you know, kind of th thrown throughout your stuff? Yeah, I mean, that's actually way more complicated than you'd think it, w it, it is because it's like on one hand, yeah, it's like... I think I haven't been doing a lot of those lately just because it's not like um, it's not what's kind of motivating me in my work right now. But in the earlier days, yeah, there's a lot of poop jokes, a lot of diarrhea jokes, firstly, because they're funny. They're funny. It, but it would it was always in this like, OK, I'm going to do one of those and then I'm going to do one about, uh, you know, mass incarceration where it's like, yeah, you kind of draw folks in with with just straight up humor and then you kind of do the same thing but for something a uh, that's certainly more serious but it's also like a lot of that stuff was from just from a creator standpoint of you know in a lot of my stuff i kind of feel like i'm i hide behind technique and and sometimes it's nice to just pull all that off and just go with the absolute stupidest idea you have in your head and tell that little voice that says this is you should not do anything with this this is just ridiculous sometimes it's good to just tell that voice to fuck off and just go for it and you know um diarrhea and boner jokes isn't all of who i am as a person that thinks that that's funny but it certainly is part of it so it's just kind of acknowledging that yeah it's the it's the internet i think i think sometimes it's okay to just be as ridiculous as possible it's kind of a art form to like say i'm not afraid to just be a complete fucking idiot so sometimes that's kind of liberating brings us back to something i asked earlier i think i kind of conflated two different questions but to, to kind of go back to that there is this kind of very strong political dialogue in in your work but there's a great deal of irony as well and then these kind of just outright mm -hmm. kind of toilet humor or kind of uh, sexual sexual i mean let's say sexual humor but humor around kind of you know genitalia and stuff and come and stuff so i mean mm -hmm. it's a two different thing so then when somebody sees you know like there's a, a brilliant uh, eight bit kind of you know style image of a skateboarder um with a hammer and sickle as well there and the text says nationalize everything so it's kind of a skateboarder kind of you know in the throes of doing a stunt looking kind of heroic i guess um and and then it, you know this text says nationalize everything with the with the hammer and sickle there so i mean that appears to be very um politicized uh, and it and it kind of you know cast you as a as a communist of the soviet variety um mm -hmm. or at least you know one of the statist variety but then you know alongside stuff about you know piss and shit and cum and stuff it's like yeah you know, how, how are we supposed to take this you know do you think you're able to basically hide behind irony all the time is that a strategy or are we say are we to take that you're not really serious ever I don't, I don't know no no i'm 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 extremely serious like uh i think if i think if anybody takes the time to watch the show they'll have no question about the fact that these are the things I believe in and that it's, uh, you know, but, but as far as that one nationalize everything, I think that that's, um, you know, I don't really know how I self define myself. It seems to change every day. I think throughout everything, what it is, is I'm just so thoroughly fucking disgusted with the status quo and the misery that people are forced to live under that I, that those images and those 
phrases are purely just a response to express that frustration. I approach memes like art. I just I just kind of sit down and if there's something that I need to get out, that's what comes out. I don't think a lot about and maybe it's maybe it's foolish of me with the the reach that I have, but I don't think a lot about the consequences. I just think about that it feels really good to express that anger and frustration and sometimes it's uh sometimes I'm express, expressing hope and sometimes I'm just expressing that uh you know that I think boners are funny. I think that sometimes I just want to provoke people and to show them something a little bit extreme to get their own internal dialogue going of like, you know, I think it's cool that you see that and you ask like what is the intent here? What is the uh, what is the level of irony here? Shit, I honestly don't know either. It's just it's just my process of sitting down and and my heart expresses these things in that way. Yeah, I mean, I, I get that, I, and actually, I mean, the question is really uh, a clarification. Though, I think sometimes we make hammer and sickle memes when we're not really status communists. I think sure. we're more leaning towards anarchists, but sometimes it comes up as like the way to talk about leftism more, you know, I don't know as, a, as a provocation, perhaps. Um, then I'm aware that that can upset some people from from the former Soviet Union, for example, uh, even leftists. So, so it's a, you know, it's something you have to kind of make a decision whether it's something that's worth doing or not. I think, you know, it's a symbol that means so many things to so many different people, but mm -hmm. certainly can, can get dialogue going. Um, but aside from that, I think that this kind of phenomenon of, of, of putting out ironic messages and messages which are quite immediate and don't like really lead to much beyond themselves, except for maybe, you know, forcing a, a, a quite kind of maybe even heated debate quite 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 quite, 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 quite quickly quite, quite. or you know i think this is something that happens because we almost don't know what to do anymore and mm -hmm. it's like you know we're in this really bad situation you said that you just really dislike the status quo and i think a lot of people are in the same position and and we're in this kind of um this moment where capitalism seems to be the only the only possibility and anything you do, you know it's going to immediately feed back into that. So memes always feed back into that because they lead to clicks and the clicks lead to data for Facebook, you know, or for Google or whoever. Um, yeah. And I think that, that that kind of thing of like, there is no hope, chimes a bit with, with debates happening after World War II, uh, particularly around the Frankfurt School, these German philosophers, that some, some, some of whom were exiled to the US during World War II and, 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 and some returned, some stayed in the US, one of which Walter Benjamin died trying to get to the US, committed suicide because he, he thought he was going to be caught, you know, trying to escape Europe to, to the US as, as a German Jew. But these people kind of, you know, at the end of World War II, when they're trying to rebuild Germany, especially Adorno, ends up saying things like, there's really no hope, one can't make art after the barbarity of World War II. But in the famous essay, when he says that, or the most famous instant he says it, he later says, we have yeah. to make it anyway. So we can't make art, we have to, so we don't surrender to the cynicism of capitalism. Mm -hmm. um, and I think I see that happening with uh, with younger millennials and Gen Z, that they, that, you know, they make selfies, they make memes. They could even be like, you know, teenage girls, old young women make, making selfies to, you know, to just be appreciated because they want to kind of consolidate their their being you know to, they want to be liked basically but mm -hmm. it's still a process of dealing with the shitness of reality and trying to overcome it somehow so you throw out images then you throw out another image and another image and another image um, it is partly because you're trying to get likes and that's a cynical kind of uh, you know process by which capitalism proceeds on online because uh, we want to get likes just because as humans we want to be liked but I think also it is like this kind of thing of banging our head against a brick wall, but eventually that brick wall has to give or might give. You see what I mean? Mm -hmm. So I think that maybe is why you know so many people put out ironic images that might express this one minute, you know, toilet humor. Then the next minute, it's you know something about Soviet communism, and you know in that you're not unique. So it's part of a process the thing happening now. But the thing is, you're embodying it, maybe more effectively than most people because visually you have the skills hmm. you know 
that's why you, you have so many followers um anyway that's just my analysis of, of why it happens i don't know if you you can agree with that at all because it's deeply kind of abstract yeah i mean i think i think posting memes i think posting selfies i think a lot of that is to i think a lot of that's just a natural thing of saying hey i'm I, i'm here i exist uh you know like we we kind of disappear into the uh into that hopelessness you're talking about one of your memes which is maybe the first i actually saw out in the wild before i had known about your page and it kind of encapsulates all of that together and it's uh the time fergie pissed herself on stage commemorative plate so it's like an ad for a commemorative plate you know which like are supposed to be highlighting and documenting and like you know giving importance to these uh cultural significant moments and you know but instead of the moon landing or 9 11 or something like that fergie pissing herself on stage while singing let's get retarded because it can appeal to so many people but kind of also highlights the banality of this pop culture it can like really just like the way the mad magazine ads would have worked kind of stick into your head wait a second something's not right about this we should be, yeah <laughs> there should be something else than this please don't let this speak for me <laughs> yeah i i feel like that that one more than a lot of them are like something that makes sense in the context of mad magazine more than anything else it's uh it really reminds me of some of the ones that i really that i really liked as a kid there there was one of my favorite ones in mad magazine growing up was it was a advertisement for a limited edition pewter smurf and it was like the whole point of it was that it was a limited edition of something like 10 million or something like that but it was really just kind of like all that deceptive media and advertising practices put into one little half page image and that thing stuck with me forever it's like the stuff people sell it's uh the way that they sell it and yeah so like it, it almost feels like there would actually be a fergie piss plate in fact people have been asking me to to produce them for quite a while now so ever since that one came out so but yeah i think the uh i think the image is enough i actually oh yeah i, I recently started selling an art print of it that i that i print out a jacle print and sign it so those those that's probably the only physical form that'll ever ever exist in if you have been enjoying our content please consider registering your desire with the algorithm by liking and subscribing this really does help us grow and reach a wider community if you would like to support our work of documenting and nurturing the rise of post-capitalist desires, become a patron. This allows us to continue research-based memes, podcasts, and videos, as well as up our production value. Patrons receive early views of videos, exclusive content, and more, including physical art and the ability to directly influence our research topics. The building of a better world happens on many fronts. Turn on, tune in, and shape a future collective reality. Yeah, I, I also I think just how succinct your statements are is, is partly why they work and why you have such a following. Like there's one I'm looking at now, and it's basically like you have a computer and you have these kind of um, familiar icons from social media coming out of the computer, like they're in space. Um, mm -hmm. And it basically says, why the fuck is everybody such a fucking asshole online? And that's coming out of the computer. And then on the computer, you have this, would you like to log off the online? Yes, no. And it kind of it, it embodies this frustration that we all have. None of us really want to be here, but we, mm -hmm. we are. Is that something you struggle with a lot as somebody like obviously very much online? Yeah, yeah, I do. Like, especially, especially recently with doing this show and putting my face on things like, there have been some instances of people just saying personal shit and taking just like it's like i think hiding behind anonymity gave me a lot of cover where i you know didn't give a shit about a lot of the comments and i really try not to go into them but you see it every day if you go online it's just like there's it's such a toxic place it's also it's also there's also beautiful stuff that goes on online every day i mean i've made great friends you know, I got to watch a police precinct burn to the ground last year on my phone. 
um, which was like maybe one of the only times I've felt some sort of hope for my kid's future. Uh, and so there, there's all this beautiful stuff that happens online and there's all this terrible stuff just, just under the surface, uh, not even really under the surface, just everywhere. And I don't really like being online, you know, and it's, and I actually have been struggling with it for the past few months where I just have completely not given a shit about posting things. And it's, it feels like a lot of the fun has been sucked out of it. You know, I still make stuff every day, but, but it's the, the motivation to uh, engage on there has kind of been replaced with kind of a dread of of being on there so, yeah I, I, so. I did um i i have kind of experienced this thing of being attacked online recently i'm not even going to go into it except to say that it's pretty horrible um and often it's like a, it, it kind of arises from a total misunderstanding of irony uh, which mm-hmm. is you, be, you can be like well, it's so freaking obvious what i'm saying and if the person just thought a bit they would understand you know, they were probably agreeing with you anyway. That's why, you know, that's the point. That's that, that, that exactly the point of, of of them attacking you and you thinking, well, you've missed the irony because, you know, they're actually agreeing with you uh, or something. Uh, mm-hmm. It's is kind of uh, difficult. I find it hard to see how you would be attacked, though, being as everything is so steeped in irony. And it's a lot to do with just the way algorithms work, the way that it's not really about any logical uh, discourse emerging. It's more about getting people clicking. Mm-hmm. So precisely the wrong people can be attacked or the wrong ideas can be put forward or no sensible idea. But, you know, then out of this occasionally something gets thrown up, like now the England football team, because they take the knee before the matches, you know, when people show support for Black Lives Matter by taking the knee. Um, some Conservative MPs uh, from the government in England have said, I'm not going to support the England team. And actually Nigel Farage, who's who's kind of like populist right a good friend of trump said that the english team are marxists so a lot of left people started claiming that so when england beat the other day in the european championships of football they beat um um ukraine four nil on a brilliant display um somebody well, people started posting in the thousand and thousands on twitter saying look how good england got a football since they became marxists so I woke up on Sunday, there's like 15,000 people tweeting about Marxism and, and the English football team, nearly all positive about Marxism and football, which of course comes out of somebody trying to mischaracterize both Marxism and the football team and Black Lives mm-hmm. Matter. But from that, you know, we could say to people, well, hey, you know, why don't we talk about what Marxism really is? It's possible, you know. So it's interesting how mm-hmm. the internet can throw up in the literal sense, throwing up... Um, some positive opportunities. I don't, I don't know how, how useful that is because then, you know, how realistically, how realistic is it I'm going to go and interact with people who have heard about the football team being called Marxist and say, hey, do you want to know about the Labour theory of value? It's not really giving us that much of an opportunity. It's just showing just how much the whole thing is messed up that no, you know, some, sometimes it happens that your side is kind of winning online, but for all the wrong reasons. Yeah, um, yeah. It's kind of really messed up. Anyway, let's talk about your series um seize the memes which is a joke on i suppose seize the means of production and there is actually a book called seize the memes of production you may know of which is edited by alfie bound and he, he has some other co-editors which came out a couple of years ago so it's, a, it's a, kind mm-hmm. of a collection of essays on, on on memes but without getting into that it's a great series it's really well produced i mean it has your kind of production values from your memes but you know, how much did it mark a departure point? For instance, you're actually on the show talking. That actually is you, uh, I guess. Um, <laughs> that's pretty amazing because you just you do. You're so brilliant on camera, like the kind of thing of this irony of this kind of um, guy who defines himself as like kind of a '40s guy. And uh, I don't know. You kind of decide to find yourself as a sad star in some sense, and it's kind of <laughs> funny. You've got his self-deprecating humor, obviously, but it's done very well so you've made that leap very well but also i mean you're dealing with moving image you do have some kind of moving image pieces on your your insta but they're fairly short so how much was this a technical challenge and how did you approach it and how are you liking it oh man it was it was the whole thing was terrifying i'll be completely honest like um this really was born of a seed of idea that I've been carrying around with myself for like four years that just at some point I had to deal with. Um, and it, it's funny, like, yeah, it's a total departure point. I, uh, 
I've, I've done some, you know, motion graphics work, usually like title design and stuff for different productions. So I've kind of seen how productions work behind the scenes being the graphics guy, um, but never, in, never did anything um, even remotely like this, uh, including performing um, in front of a camera, including writing a script. Um, but I think like I was talking earlier about how I've just always been creating my whole life and uh, everything that I've kind of touched in all those years, all those decades kind of led me to this point of, you know, having this idea that I could possibly pull this thing off. Um, so yeah, it's like that little seed needed to be made. So in order to make it during a pandemic lockdown where, you know, everything was shut off and, and knowing I had to do this on myself, I had to pretty much pull everything off um, in my garage um, on my own and figure it out as I went along. Um, you know, I had never, I, I, I edited in a premiere and had never even installed that app until uh, this process came along. So um, yeah, it was terrifying. It was terrifying also just coming to the realization that to make this piece of art I wanted to make, which is this show, I was going to have to kind of abandon the anonymity that I've enjoyed all these years, you know, of just being a uh, only speaking through my work and not actually having much of a sense of who I am as a person involved with it. So uh, once I made that decision to go forward and create this thing that I saw in my head, uh, it was like, okay, so if I'm going to show who I am and be an actual human being in this thing, kind of, I'm still kind of hiding behind teenage step that a little bit and a little bit of characterization. But behind all that is like total sincerity about who I am, what I believe. And like, um, I think that comes across in the show. So, um, you know, there's a lot of irony still involved and it's hopefully funny at times, but at other times I think it's pretty serious and sincere. And, um, but yeah, the, 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 the entire thing was scary and I almost broke the entire show about 20 times along the way, not knowing what I'm doing. Um, but yeah, that, that's that's kind of what I do in my daily work for the meme page too, is I just have this confidence that if I don't know how to do something, I'll eventually figure it out and not being afraid to try it out. So um, thankfully- well, yeah, but, that, but that's like some really good skills you have because we also kind of, me and Adam kind of think if we don't know what we're doing, we'll work something out, but we don't have the, quite the same production values that you have. Um, so I'm really impressed by that. I mean, I've been, using Premier, that. I've, I've been using Premiere for quite a while and I often just can't get quite what I want. It's partly this thing of After Effects that scares me. So I've used it a couple of times, but um, mm. yeah, really yeah, I, th I, I think I think getting pretty well steeped in After Effects before I jumped in Premiere was um, an advantage as opposed to the other way around. Um, so yeah, I think that all that stuff kind of you know, learning After Effects is it, it's another case example of that. It's like at some point, a client of mine was like, hey, you should animate these things. And I was like, yeah, sure, I can do that, having no idea how to do it, and like delivered them, them something like a week later. So yeah, it's just, but I, that's where I like to be. I like, I like to be working on stuff that I don't know how to do. If I know how to do it, it stops being as fun. I, I think yeah. I want. I think I want to make more of these, more of these sorts of projects because uh, the terror is kind of appealing to me. Yeah, I, I, you talk actually uh, in your series, the, uh, the fourth one. There's seven in all, I think, and there's four currently out. Yeah, six, uh, six, six total episodes. I think six four total, out. Okay. Yeah. And there'll be five or six around when we get this podcast out. You talk about dropping out of art school and just doing the stuff anyway. I mean, I went to art school before I studied philosophy. It was kind of fun. I must say, I mean, probably my main defense of academia, although I dislike it seriously, particularly for the, the, the tuition fees um, that, are, mm -hmm. that are charged. Uh, and I've actually I made a podcast recently about the downfalls of uni from the point of view of both the student and uh, lecturer because I have lectured as well mm -hmm. but um, yeah I think I think I've really found actually later on uh, writing my thesis like having someone to sort of say to you hey that's not really working when as a writer your friends will always tell you your writing is good however shit it is mm -hmm. so you know if you do have someone a professor a stern professor they might kind of literally tell you the truth 
but that's kind of a different feel that's in theory but the thing that occurs to me is that you can have that anyway online without the fees there's enough of us who would who would value a kind of sharing network sharing education mm -hmm. network that you know you could still have your stern kind of basically boomers um who tell people you know your writing is not quite work not quite working go back and look at that you can even do that with memes to some degree like we have a um, reading group me and adam where we also make memes in response to the the theory we're reading and we talk about each other's memes um so i mean yeah by now we don't really need the university to to be critical of each other so i mean given that i do largely agree that you can just look at stuff and and and, and make stuff yourself so i'm glad you kind of made that but, i mean is, how much is that your own feeling of yeah having maybe dropped out of art college yourself or not done it or you did it and didn't value it what's your own story? yeah i i mean that that one goes way back i uh you know i like again i've been ma i've been making art my whole life it's always been how i define myself i had this really weird realization when i was 15 years old that i can remember just like it was yesterday of having this sense that tying what i love to do um which is to create to my livelihood which is what i don't like to do i mean even to this day just making a living is such a fucking drug i had this sense at 15 that i wanted to have a separation between those things of what i love to do for fun and what i would have to do to survive so i kind of just made the decision right then and there that i would you know work my way working jobs that are just jobs that are you know the the best that i could get, get with, without a college education but um and the most enjoyable that i could get without a college education but that i would always reserve creation for my own time and that's kind of what i had that's what i have done my whole life till i started a meme page at around i guess 37 years old and was approached by a major media company to to work for a turner subsidiary called super deluxe that were like hey we like your jokes uh would you mind doing that for us for money and um so i looked back at my, my 15 year old self and said uh you know what dude let's 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 just, let's see what happens so that's kind of what led me to where i am now but um I, I, I think that that show, it really comes off as dogmatic of uh, as me. I mean, I'm literally saying drop out of art and design school. Um, but I, it, it's all I can do is express the point of view that I've developed over the over this time. I, I think that people go into these things for different reasons. I mean, if your only consideration is to be fulfilled as an artist, then it's completely unnecessary because that is free and that that comes from doing what you want and in some ways pursuing this as a career is going to get in the way of you doing what you want you're going to have clients you're going to have to fill other people's visions and then you're going to go home and you're not going to have any juice left for yourself so if your goal like mine is to be fulfilled as an artist then maybe that is not the best path if your goal is to have a career within the arts that's probably what you're going to have to do to get there but um, I didn't get to, or I didn't get to issue much of that caution in the show as I had to edit it out. But there was a lot in there. And then you know the other aspect of it is, if you're in art school, you're with a bunch of other people in art school. And in my experience, a lot of a lot of really interesting work is created by people who don't have that path, don't have that access. Um, you know, they're making they're making stuff under very creative conditions because they don't have the right stuff, but they have the urge to make it. And, and I, I, I wanted to kind of issue a warning about people missing out on that. That one's a very personal episode. And again, it's one of those things that I think people's interpretation of what I'm trying to do with that is based on their own trips too. So, but, but I just kind of had to get those ideas out there because they've been in there for a long time. Yeah, I mean, I, I talk to students from elite art colleges um, who pay lots of money. Uh, I mean, sometimes I teach them as well and they kind of say similar things to what you're saying. I mean, it's kind of a feeling that you're working in, you know, you progress in spite of the university, not always because of it. I think mm -hmm. that's said to me very recently from a graduating student from a, from a top rated art university or college. Um, so, yeah, then the other thing I think is that, yeah, I, I think there are certainly people who will take a lot of encouragement from that. I, I know the thing is that, there are certainly people who went to uni who would take encouragement from that as much as people who didn't. Oh, so totally. Who kind, of, kind of think that, well, my uni experience wasn't really that relevant. I can still do it anyhow. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I've definitely some... encountered that as I put it out. That was a reaction of a lot of folks who went through. It was like this. I wish I, I wish I had kind of heard this. And so that's that's good to hear because maybe somebody who needs to hear that is in a similar situation to me. You know, I bought into it. I was like, oh, yeah, I'm an artist, so I'm going to go to art school because that's where I'm supposed to go. Yes, I'm really glad I didn't because I've I've had complete freedom for a long, long time to do whatever I want. And that was always my priority. So if somebody finds himself in that same sort of situation as that's what their goal is with creation, then, um, you know, maybe they can hear that and, and put it through their own filter of what their own experience is and what their own motivations are. And I, I really like the episode as well, because it's funny. I have, uh, I'm coming from that kind of from the other direction, whereas I did not go to art school, but hanging out, all of my friends were art school kids and I did a lot of drugs with them and ended up starting to make art myself. So, mm -hmm. you know, um, one of the things I have noticed is some of them, the ones that are more quote unquote successful seem to hate doing art now because oh, see? Like you said that's what they're doing. They're making mm, corporate or like highly, you know, contemporary design stuff for other people and they don't do anything for themselves and uh it seems sad to me you know they're yeah. very competent but they don't have they're they're not able to actually like execute a vision anymore whether for lack of inspiration or just pure drain because they don't have yeah. the time it it, it can su it can suck out the joy of what you're doing because you've kind of linked you've linked that sort of thing with what you always love to do so i feel i feel super fortunate i mean i have days and i have clients where i just i'm like what am i doing like i should just go get a job at the post office but generally i a lot of times people approach me to do stuff that i find interesting because they want me to do it my way or they just give me total freedom so i'm i'm super lucky but i don't think that that would have happened if i had ever pursued that as a goal like i think that pursuing just finding out who I was as a creator um, ha has given me those kind of um, strengths that 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 allow me to barely barely squeak by and stay afloat but you know I mean I could I'm sure if I was a business-minded person I could be uh, living the life and uh, you know doing all that shit but my priority remains doing what I want being true to myself, making stuff that uh, I can be proud of and feeling fulfilled. And I feel super fulfilled as an, as a creator. And that's really the only thing that matters to me. And if um, at this point, I'm usually terribly broke all the time, that seems to me a very, very good trade off. And thankfully, my wife uh, supports me in that decision. So in the very first episode, you talk about how to make your own propaganda and you speak about how memes basically enable anyone to make art, however poor from whatever background. So is this ability um, for anyone to make art and to sidestep the mostly middle class practices of the art world? Is that something you feel strongly about as well? I mean, I guess I guess you do, because that's how you started your whole series. Um, but, but can you just say something more about that? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think that you know, kind of the perspective of the show, the elevator pitch was kind of Bob Ross, but for memes. And like the thing that I think that the way, the reason that that works is that, you know, not everybody has access to all these tools that are used to create art, the, the things that are available in art schools. I mean, foundries and, uh, you know, paint, paints and art supplies can be expensive, but every everybody generally especially if they're going to be watching this program is going to have access to some tool of creation, whether it's a shitty laptop or a phone. And that's what I always loved about. That's why I got into memes. I was seeing diverse voices from all sorts of different backgrounds, poor and working class people just through brute force, like having their voices heard in the culture and spreading, spreading their voice to huge numbers of people. I, it's a really exciting thing. It's it's an art form that's in its infancy. It hasn't, it, it doesn't have any rules. It doesn't have any attention from the art establishment. It, it doesn't even, at this point, I'm sure it'll try to get co-opted at some point, but at this point, it doesn't need to, uh, it doesn't need to have any of that. It's just this organically developed kind of community kind of dialogue of people creating their own media that happened organically and i think that we could use more of that 
And yeah, the episode's called Make Your Own Propaganda because we've been inundated with the, you know, the, the worst people in the world have been defining what the world is forever. So it, this is an opportunity for us to reject all that and to uh, listen to each other as we define our own world, you know, the world that we actually live in instead of this denialist sort of point of view of this alternate reality that the media seems so intent on presenting to us every day. And are you going to be uh, getting into art on phones? Because you, I think all the episodes so far are using like, uh, you know, computer programs. Yeah, yeah. The episode five, the one that uh, comes out tomorrow on the 7th, so I'm sure it'll be out when this drops, is, uh, is the phone episode where I use, I believe I only use one app I use Fonto, P-H-O-N-T-O, which is just a uh, image imposition and text imposition software that's very simple. And yeah, that that's the phone episode. And I just got word that we're actually going to, that one's not going to be behind the paywall. That one's going to be free to everybody. That was kind of important to me that this is this is the most accessible show about the, the easiest path to... Uh, doing memes and putting them out there if that's what people are interested in doing. Yeah, so I, I was pretty stoked on that. That's that's kind of an amazing thing about working with Means TV is, uh, you know, if people don't know, it's a worker-owned uh, streaming media co-op. Uh, and um, we're subscriber-supported, but we also can offer uh, sliding scale subscriptions, even down to zero bucks if people can't pay it because we're not going to deny people the right to look at stuff that reflects their reality just because they are, are struggling or uh, don't want to pay. Uh, so the, it's cool that I made it through, uh, made it in partnership with these guys because if um, we say, hey, this one would be pretty cool to put out uh, outside the paywall structure. Even though, even though they do offer their services for free if people ask, I mean, this just takes that extra step out of the equation. So I, I, I hope people watch this one and uh, pull the phone out of their pocket and start to look at it in a different way. That it's not just uh, a device for capitalists to inundate you with, uh, with their narrative. It can be a, a device that you use to create your own. So yeah yeah and I, I make all of my memes and videos that i've done on a phone and you know often when i like friends are really surprised that i'm like no no this is all mostly free apps you can get i tend to i have like six or seven apps i kind of mm -hmm. mix to get the desired effects but yeah you don't need them you can do it with one yeah and i that's that's how i started off too and usually yeah i use a combination of you know six or seven apps and your camera roll is full of 20 works in progress while you go and that was a that was a really fun time that's that's how i started off that's how i got my first gig working for uh, super deluxe back in the day was based on stuff i was making laying in a hammock on my phone while my kid took a nap on my chest so um the the things you can do with the computer in your pocket creatively are really kind of amazing so yeah i, I hope that if people watch this one at least they have at least they get the idea that, you know, I can be part of this thing or I can at least, you know, I have this tool that I maybe haven't been looking at that way. So something that I've noticed about a good majority of your work, especially all of this stuff since you've started the Means TV uh, series, is that it's replicating physical work. Um, and I mean, you already talked about like how cool it was to learn some of those processes and what people did before computers but all of your stuff like even in the means tv productions you after you have what most people would consider a finished image you go in and add all these little touches you want to add torn edges and textures uh color fading sun spotting stuff like that mm -hmm. and then also you in one of the episodes, you go to a video store and you talk about how it's kind of like a museum for design and you could just go and look. And that's something I think about often. And I kind of wonder, am I like being, you know, having a nostalgic boomer moment? But some of my best memories of media are physical media. I, I hate reading PDFs, I hate reading ebooks, and I remember going to movie stores and looking. I remember going to, you know, record shops, and I would spend hours looking through the things, and what I would end up buying was almost always 
off of the design, off of how it looked, man. Sometimes it sucked, but usually it was able to communicate mm -hmm. that. So I was just wondering, is that why all of your stuff tries to replicate the visual uh, or the physical media? And do you think we're in danger of losing something if by switching to pure digital? Absolutely, yeah. I think I think the common thread through those experiences of the video store, the record store, the thrift shop, uh, physical media in general, is it's so there's it's such a human experience every step of the way from the you know most of these things in those uh in those uh circumstances that you're going to encounter are designed by people in 3d space in the first place you know before the before computers it uh everything uh was created on a piece of paper like right there in reality to get camera ready for press so from the production of it to the uh experience of en encountering it in the, in the in the store um and god i have some of the same memories you know i the video store has always been a really sacred place to me like a lot of really good memories there with my dad and my friends growing up my my posters on my wall were all from the free bin uh and just plastered plastered our house with those posters of howling three and big top peewee and all these ridiculous things and i think that yeah it's like if, the, the thing that we're in danger of losing by having our entire relationship with media be through a screen is that human kind of reality component of it you know we're getting to the point where these platforms like netflix and other things are they're not even using art a promo art or a poster art created by a person they're starting to do these rollouts of things where a algorithm will grab a screenshot and slap the logo on it depending on how they think based on your behavior which character you will relate to and i just find that to be really just shitty and it just turned it just it has it has this attitude that design doesn't matter that that our relationship with media is purely transactional and and i think that that's really something that we should try to avoid at all if possible yeah so like if folks still have a video store anywhere near them like i'm lucky enough to have i mean i take my kids there every weekend like i i know it's not going to last forever i know it's not and um, but for the time being, I'm really glad that I can kind of pass that along to them so that they don't just think that media is you look around the algorithm till it gives you something that you think you will like. Well, in a way, it's interesting you say that because it's also it's a way of kind. I mean, obviously, video stores are curated, et cetera. They're made by, you know, companies are making these things, but it is a way of getting around an algorithm by having to just browse through here's everything you know mm -hmm. and online if you're looking for music it can be really hard to discover mm -hmm. new music unless you're specifically like searching for new music because the algorithms curate everything you see if i go to spotify it's gonna say here are the albums we think you'll like you know 15 years ago when i'd be on internet forums and it would just be free for all people posting stuff scrolling going to the you know it's it's so mm -hmm. curated now it's yeah and then have to escape and also something like spotify it's like browsing through these interfaces can be such just kind of a just kind of a draining soul crushing experience as opposed to going to a record store where you're in the community with other people who also enjoy the same stuff as you it's like i mean th that's an experiential thing and um where you're going and enjoying more of your reality and something like spotify or netflix on your phone or whatever it is it's like you're just going into a unreal space and projecting yourself into there and removing yourself from the reality we live in it's uh i i really think that it's gonna get worse before it gets better for sure as we lose our relationship with physical media so yeah going back to your question like that's absolutely a conscious decision of adding those textured elements and make trying to make the thing resemble a physical piece because mm -hmm. those are the things I'm referencing. The things I'm referencing aren't graphics produced on a screen. Although you do have some uh, graphics produced on a screen references, though they are older graphics typically. They're like from the uh, 80s or 90s, you know, kind of early internet days. Oh, sure. Yeah, yeah. 
but yeah they do feel a little bit different they're less polished um you know than what we experience nowadays mm-hmm. My, when i do stuff um i tend to kind of embrace current digital stuff i will like do a background remove and purposefully not smooth the edges because i'm like whatever it's I want it to show an imperfection there. So that's mm-hmm. kind of my way of getting getting that through. But I, I do like the way of mimicking actual physical media as well. Yeah, I tr- I've, I've tried in the past to kind of like, you know, in meme culture, there's a lot of really rough stuff. And I kind of always like that, like as a viewer. And I, in the past, I've tried to do that. And it just, uh, I guess that's just not who I am um, in this because it, it just never, it never seemed right. It, it seemed like I was trying to do something, but I always really appreciate the, the roughness and the, uh, the way that some meme creators have this clear path of idea to finish piece to posting in the span of three minutes. Like I, I, I appreciate that. It's, I, I, I have found along the way that's not me, but man, I, I love looking at it as a, as a viewer. Yeah, we do some pretty rough stuff. <laughs> that happens. I, mean, I, I have no problems with the rough stuff. But actually, a lot of stuff comes out. When I do it, it's like it, o- it only gets like a relatively lot of likes for us if it just suddenly comes out of my head and it relates to some news thing and maybe some theory. But it suddenly like comes together in that moment. I suddenly realize, mm-hmm. hang on, there's a connection between this kind of like popular meme, what's happening in the news, and this theory we've been discussing in our mm-hmm. YouTube videos. And then it takes me like literally three minutes and it works. Actually, my successful ones are ones which are based on common meme formats like Duma and stuff, which mm-hmm. I just appropriate a bit, whereas Adam seems to go and do stuff from scratch completely more. Um, but one thing I find good for like rough stuff and psychedel- psychedelic type um, effects as well, or kind of glitched effects uh, also, is Photomosh, this app website called Photomosh. And you just stick a photo in there and you keep pressing. I think it's mosh or something and it uh it distorts but then once once it distorts it in various ways you've got a whole lot of sliders down the right hand side so it would have like picked three of them and messed about with like maybe adding some slice lines in there and um kind of multi-colors but you're able to then like move those things it's done around like yeah more yeah or less of that there's something, there's something really something cool, cool about that, about that. it's that like, like uh, uh um, um, deep fried deep memes. memes. I think that the the reason people reason like the way those look is because really good memes would be shared over and over and over again and screenshotted over and over and over again, which is like a natural uh, way to create that process. So I think when we see one like that, it's like, oh shit, yeah, subconsciously, I think, oh shit, this must be good because it's just fried all the hell. So, um, which is funny in a medium where, you know, it, it can be lossless if uh, people are sharing them correctly. But, it, it, yeah, it's, it's pretty cool. I, I, love, I love stuff that looks like that. I think in, a, in, a, in another life, hopefully, I'll get to explore the, those aesthetics of memes. But okay. haven't been well, able to make it work. Yeah, we can make you a tutorial. Sick. Maybe. <laughs> yeah, we could do that. We have actually got a couple of tutorials, but they're just like nothing like yours. Um, but they're kind of like a joke on these quite low-quality Photoshop tutorials that can do very, very well on uh, YouTube, where I literally show people the Photoshop screen, where I've been like talking people through um, critical theory, like Frankfurt School and things, Mm -hmm. whilst making a meme. I know you did the music video for one of my favorite bands, um, Andrew Jackson G, or AJJ now, um, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. for Mega Guillotine 2020. I was wondering how that came about and if you've done any other music videos or projects like that yeah um ajj uh our buddies um they're real rad dudes and um i've kind of known them like a kind of on the like kind of peripherally for a bit but um we all live in the same town and once 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 they moved here then we uh started spending some time together and it's a cool relationship to have with uh, other folks who are kind of every day exploring their creativity as their livelihood. Uh, Cause there's a lot of stuff that we can talk about that uh, is kind of hard to talk to other folks about. Um, so yeah, that just came from a friendship relationship and, and enjoying each other's art. You know, I love their music and they like the work that I put out. And then uh, that was a real fun one, very similar to this show of not really knowing how, how what I was doing or how, how I was going to pull it off, but just putting the time in in the garage and having them over and 
play around in front of the green screen. Um, and then, yeah, I, I really enjoy doing music videos. I've done a few at this point. I did one for uh, Jeff Rosenstock uh, for his song Scram, which is a killer tune. And that was kind of a challenge because this was a... That is great. This was a full-on quarantine video where everybody was at their house. So how do we bring them together into a video? So we came up with a concept and figured that out. And that one was a lot of fun. Those guys are all super cool. And then um, I also did one for a band, Nothing, Philadelphia-based band that kicks a lot of ass. And they were just fans of the page. And I give them a lot of credit. They uh, Dominic reached out to me and said, hey, do you want to do our music video for our song? And it's like, which is cool because I had never demonstrated I could even do anything approaching that. So uh, that one was super scary because I heard the song and had this uh, visuals in my head that would go along with it that I had no idea how I was going to pull off, but it, it all worked out too. And I really love that one. And those it's fun because you live with those songs for, for a long period of time constantly. And when it's over, uh, you know, my kids, I work from home. So my kids have heard that song quite a few times. So, We'll be driving down the street and they'll say, Dad, can you put on the, the, the spaceship song, which is the nothing video? Or can you put on the, the I, I can't remember how they say mega guillotine, but it's really cute. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, it's fun. Those things, those things are fun because we're steeped in them all together for a long time. And then they kind of uh, become part of our family life. And, uh, yeah, it's really cool doing music videos. I, get, I hope I get to do some more of them down, down the road. Yeah, that's wonderful. I didn't realize you did the Scram music video, and it makes so much sense now. I love that video, yeah. I, I, you should do more of those with those kind of artists, because, yeah, it, it fits together perfectly. Yeah, yeah. I've been, I've been really lucky to work with really cool dudes, so I'd love to do more of that. Your first post is dated June 2016 on your Teenage Stepdad Insta, so not that long ago. And actually, you can see a progression uh, of quality so they're quite simple your early ones but quite quickly mm -hmm. you get in a lot of the 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 effects and skills you've been using throughout obviously you've been adding things as you go along but you manage always to stay fresh and publish kind of really good content uh publishing once every week maybe twice a week sometimes um how do you keep that freshness how do you uh, get to do great things always do you ever get creative block oh man yeah, I'd say like in the early days, like um, I I was kind of had a lot of stuff kind of bottled up over the years that was really easy for me to access and turn into a piece. Uh, and maybe for like the past four years, I've had creative block. I don't really uh, I don't generally sit down and have an idea of what I'm going to create. I kind of touched on this earlier. Sometimes I do. Sometimes I have. Oh, this is a phrase. You know, if, you, if I look at my notes app on my phone, it used to be full of all these ideas and then I just kind of plow through them. And, uh, and it, but these last few years, it's a totally different process where I don't really approach it with a starting point. I just kind of, I, the piece kind of develops over, over time. Um, and yeah, and, and my output has kind of, as I've been working on the show and busy with other things has, and, and this whole phase I'm going through of not really giving a shit about posting. <laughs> Uh, my output's kind of gotten a little uh, less prolific, but there's a time and place for everything. And I think right now it's like uh, I'm just kind of doing a lot of stuff that I don't actually share. And um, that is kind of working on other other bigger stuff like, like this show. Um, but yeah, I mean, honestly, that that is the full story is that I have had creative block consistently for three or four years where it doesn't feel like... Um, but the, the thing that pulls me through on that is the inspiration of, of enjoying the process of sitting down in front of the computer and finding out what's going to happen. So maybe maybe calling that a creative block isn't really accurate because uh, it's just a different process of creation for me, I guess I would say, um, where it, the idea is kind of out there. It's just if I sit in front of the computer, it'll it'll show me what it is, I guess. It's good to hear. I mean, I think a lot of people will, will, will feel very inspired and 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 i think it's great to have been speaking with you about about you know all of this and, and getting to understand your process okay guys thank you we've been with teenage stepdad uh check out his work on teenage stepdad at instagram or teenagestepdad.com where you can also buy his art prints and 
please also check out Means TV and the series Season the Memes. Quit school, take some drugs, make some art. Trust me, I have a meme page.